Well, it's good that everybody's here this morning. Not quite everybody, but most, most of the people are here. Uh, we have a special, uh, we have some special guests. That's the way you put it here this morning. And this group is very, very dear to me. Uh, let me tell you a little story about this group and how it came into being. This is my version of it. And, of course, they might have another version of how they came into being. Okay. Uh, I came here uh, probably 30 years ago or 25 years ago to speak at what was then the um, Philadelphia School of the Bible. I came primarily to do a lecture series, and that lecture series ended on uh, uh, Friday evening. And uh, one of the professors there asked me would I stay over for the weekend and teach his Sunday school class at 10th Presbyterian Church. Well, of course, 10th Presbyterian Church, to me, was like almost to the end of the world. You know, how could you get an opportunity? I'm going to teach a Bible class, not preach, but teach a Bible class at 10th Presbyterian Church. They had an adult class there of about uh, 150 people. It's the, it's the, uh, the, the congregation of uh, Donald Gray Bonhouse, and he was bigger than life himself. And of course, who, the young man who had replaced him as a pastor there was a young man, had never pastored uh, uh, a church before, uh, named James Boyce, Dr. James Boyce. And, uh, and so I talked to Sunday school class. This thing here is giving me trouble. Who, who's supposed to work this out? <laughs> this ain't working, folks. Can you fix it? Yeah, let me, I'm going to use, I'm going to be teaching, I'd rather use this one. Can I get rid of this one altogether? Okay. You think it'll be okay? Okay. And, and so uh, I, uh, I came that morning, of course, to teach at the church. And this young Jane Boyce, outstanding scholar and pastor was pastor, was there. And uh, I taught to Sunday school class. I probably gave the, the talk that I had given about 500 times. You know, you know what I mean? Because you don't come to a place like this and try out no new talk uh, with, with the people. And, uh, and, and so I, I, um, I, I gave my, it was a teaching, and I had an hour to teach. And I made my best shot. And, uh, and, and I noticed in the back of the building, uh, this young man came in there scholarly looking guy and sitting down on the back seat and was just taking notes as I was teaching. And then when I finished teaching, he walked up to me and you don't if you knew Jane Boyce, he was a while well, he was a scholar in all of that. And while you would see him as a off a of present, there was a sort of a timid boyish about him, you know. And uh, he said to me, he said, uh, I'm gonna ask you to do something. I, I've never asked anybody to do, you know. Uh, I church, I planned my sermons uh, months in advance, and he said it's going out live over the radio, you, you, you know, and I'm into a series. He said, but would you um, come and preach this morning exactly what you taught in the Sunday school class? Man, that was a something. And so I taught that, and of course that developed a relationship with Jane Boyce. Um, then he asked me to come back uh, several times to do his mission, to do his mission conference. Then he said something to me about, um, what can I do as a church like this to carry out this mission of urban development? What can we do? What is the best thing we can do to do that? I, uh, first thing I said, first thing you need to do is to move into this community, relocate, <laughs> come back to this community. And in a few months, I heard back that Jane Boyce and his family is moving into the city. It's one of the most outstanding churches in this town. And then a few months later, he and his wife started this academy. And the academy was to take the people from the urban community and to make certain that they got a quality education. And she's been doing this. Jane Boyce, you know, a few years ago, went home to be with the Lord. And, I, and I'm still in touch with that school. It's one of my favorite schools. Of course, I got a favorite school in every city. Because, 
<laughs> because, uh, because I really believe in the end, and we are here that this morning, it's what we do with these children. It's how we uh, educate them and prepare them for the, for the future. And over here in this corner, I want my uh, Urban Academy, let me see the name of the high school here, Center City Academy. Uh, would all of you stand? Okay, okay. And what I want is uh, uh, Mrs. Jane Boyce. Would you would you stand? She was the founder of the school. And so we are delighted to, that you are here. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, and you ought to bring your Bibles with you, uh, I want you to turn to Psalms 11. Psalms 11. What we wanted CCDA to be is to, first of all, be Christian, born-again Christian, people who believe in Jesus Christ, and believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and it is inspired by God, it is God's Word, but it's also practical for living. Uh, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for education in righteousness. That's how we should live. The Christian life is a life that we live here on earth. The, the Christian church is the continuation of the life of Jesus of Nazareth here on earth. As he was, so are we in the world. And the Bible said that he went about all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and healing the sick, feeding the hungry, taking care of the people in need. We, the church, is the continuation. We are his body here on earth. And to me, as I look at this growing church today, I see it more becoming an extension of American individualism, selfish, and greed. Instead of us being the model, modeling out Jesus' life in the world, we have turned the church into meeting our own individual need. And that's why this prosperity theology is about to conquer the urban community, unrelated to the real needs of the people in the community. And so CCDA's task is to mobilize these churches, these growing churches, within the community, to actually be the people of God, to be the body of Christ, and to really live out the word, where the word becomes a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. What we're trying to do here is to put the word of God in practice. James puts it so beautiful. He says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And if you become a hearer of the word, and not a doer of the word, we deceive ourselves. And that's why I say that the church can accommodate racism and bigotry and all of these things because we are hearers of the word and not doers of the word. And that we have assumed that we can be Christian and bigots and racist in our society. We are here to mull out the life of Jesus. And he's given us a book to do that with. And that book is the Bible, the Word of God. This book is a book practical for living. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is practical for instruction in righteousness that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished to do God's good work here on earth. Redemption is a redemption to do the work of God here on earth. Paul says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourself. It's the gift of God. 
not of our own works so that anyone should boast. But he says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Let your light so shine before the humanity that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. We have over-individualized Christianity. And so this message this morning is really a rally cry for action for the church, to engage this church in action. The church is growing, but all the statistics that has to do with uh, uplift and development in the urban community is getting worse. While the church is growing, the problems that we were left here to deal with and the light and the salt that we used to be in the community is getting dimmer and dimmer in our community. And so this is the beginning of a series that I want to give this week to really engage the church in concrete action. And when I get finished this morning, I'm going to call two brothers up and I'm going to assign them for some concrete action. Tomorrow morning, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to activate. We're going to assign you something to do. That when we leave here, we can begin to put the word into practice in relationship to the needs that we have in the urban community. So let's go now to our Psalms 11. This, let me read it to you, the entire psalm. And our text and subject will be taken from Psalm 11. Psalm 11. In the Lord, I take reference. How can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strain to shoot at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked he shall rain fire and cold and a burning supper. That will be their lot. For the righteous Lord loveth justice, and upright men will see his face. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, and I pray now that your Holy Spirit would come and do his work of applying your word to our heart and to our lives that we might have a desire to live it out. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My question that I'm going to answer this morning is when the foundation of our society is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? So verse 3 is my text this morning. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let me share with you how I go to scripture, how I study the scripture. I take the Bible to be the, the word of God, and I take the Old Testament to be the, how we look at how when God was living in the midst of his people, how those people behaved. And so when I go to the scripture, I go to the scripture with the burden that I have. What is my burden? What is my concern? And then I go to the scripture and try to find what we would call in legal terms a sort of a precedent. Where have my situation has been dealt with in the Bible? So I go back there and I try to find a passage that is relevant to the burden that I have. And then I began to try to look at how they solved their problem and then by applying the word of God and then how I can use the word of God 
to solve the problems that I face. We're facing a problem here that the foundation of our society. The background to this psalms here comes out of David's greatest crisis he had in life. David had many great crises. The greatest of David's crisis is when his own son Absalom had stole the kingdom from him. And Absalom was on his way to Jerusalem from here, set up his kingdom in Hebron. And he's on his way with the troops to kill David, to kill his whole family, and that he alone was going to be the king. This was the most embarrassing, outrageous thing that could ever happen to a person, and a person like David. And this psalm sort of come out of that cry. It's a rally cry. It, it's like a rally. He's figuring to speak to the troops as they're getting ready now to go on the field of battle to try to restore him to the, to the, to the kingdom. It's like he calls them together. It's a... He's sending them to the battlefield, and he says to them, when the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, it's out of great challenges that society has been changed. It, is, it was what we call the Gettysburg Address was really a, a rallying speech when, when, the, when, the, when the South was about to win the war. And they had come together to dedicate a cemetery to bury all of these dead bodies. And Abraham Lincoln having to come by. And while this Supreme Court justice making this two hours speak, he jotted down a few words. What he did was he took the longings of America. He took our hopes of America. What America would be would be. Could there be this nation conceived of one nation under God with liberty and justice for all? He took all of their longings and he put it together in about a two-minute speech. And it becomes the Gettysburg Address. And it becomes the rallying point. And from that speech and from that rally, he explained to them why they was on the battlefield. And he raised the question, is, is it possible for any nation to develop a nation that would be committed to this idea of oneness? One nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. This was an experiment in history. Well, you'll know what happened. This is speech is like 1963. Civil rights workers have been killed, buried in town. We were living in the South in segregation, dehumanized in every possible way. Martin Luther King brought a few hundred thousand people. The fact he brought it to the Lincoln Memorial and he says that we are trying to finished the work that Abraham Lincoln started. He said that uh, they made a proposition that all men was created equal and were endowed by their creator with certain rights. Among these, a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He said that was a promissory note. That was a note that every American bond would be entitled by birth to that right. He said, but we as black people have been trying to achieve that. And, and we've been, it was a blank check. And it all, every bond person had to do was fill out that blank check and send it in and benefit from that. He said, but every time we fill out that black blank check and send it in, we get a note back from the bank that says, insufficient fund. He said there is no insufficient fund in the tray of heaven.
understand that we have come here today to begin the process of cashing that check. And he said, we'll know when it's cash. We'll know when it's cash. That when my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their, their character. It was a rallying speech. Right. Well, this morning, this is a rallying This is a rallying speech for us, the church, to take responsibility for our neighborhoods and for our community. He says now, when the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, what is the foundation of our society? That's our first question. The foundation of all society is the family. It ain't no accident that God said that when we get married, uh, we were to stay together with that wife until death do us part. That's not because God didn't want us to have sex. God wants sex is the way we repopulate the society. God intended that. He told us to multiply, multiply. And so it's not that God is against us, but life is so precious that he wanted that life to be embodied in a responsible relationship. A man and a woman together and nurturing that child. What has broken our society? What is the foundation of our society? It's two. It says, when the foundation are being destroyed. It's two. It's the family and it's the village. It's the family and it's the community. It's broken in our society. That's the problem. Oh, I was excited about the fact that there are people here in Philadelphia, who is outraged about the killing, about the drive-by and the killing, I, I'm not certain that they are dealing with the solution. I'm with them in getting these guns off the street. But getting these guns off the street is not the answer to the problem. It's a part of the answer. It's a symptom of the problem. But what's broken our community is the family. Seventy percent of all of our children born in the urban community is born without a father in the home. In my community, 84% of the children are being raised without a father in the home. You see, the family is a place where love is nurtured. It's a place where the family takes primary responsibility for the children and nurturing them in society. In the urban community, that family is broke. Now, y'all know that. We all know that. When I get to the prison, I find out 97% of the young blacks, of the almost 2 million blacks in that country, we are running right near 3 million people incarcerated. It's the highest percentage of a nation's population in prison at any time in history apart from a war in our society. And so we know back the background that almost 100% of those kids who commit these murders and crime have dropped out of high school, don't have a father, don't have the support. But you know that. Y'all all know that. So we know that the family is in, is in trouble. I was given a talk at a university, and I was really pretty well talking to the faculty and staff and all the PhDs. And I, I said basically what I said here uh, together. And one of those wonderful ladies there, one of the PhDs, she sort of reshaped what I said, and then, but she made it totally hopeless. What can you do about it? And uh, she asked me that question. I said, look like to me, the answer to that question is to have some wedding. Have some wedding. That if we could get some young men 
to marry some young women and keep them together, that seems to be the answer to that problem. So we know the family is broke. We know that. The family is first base. But we have a problem that is larger than the breakdown of the family. As horrible as that might be, we have a problem that is bigger than that. And that's the breakdown of the community. We don't have enough moral stamina within the urban community. We don't have the people there that can transmit spiritual wisdom to these children. Because God's spiritual wisdom is translated incarnational. It is the young man taking care of the young boy. It is the young women taking care of the older women taking care of the young women. Spirituality is transferred incarnational. Now we can do a lot of information through the net, but it is people, it is family who transmits value and nurture into the society. And what are those values and nurture that we got to transfer? It is called in the Bible, in Galatians 5, it is called the fruit of the Spirit. And that's love, kindness, perseverance, all of, and those are transmitted from people to people. And that's the family's responsibility. We all know now the best thing that we can do when we go, to, go back to our community is to mentor a child. To me, mentoring then is that one last option we have of transmitting our values to the child. But it's the community that holds in the values. It is the community that holds in the, the dialect, the values of society. And so what's broken our society is the community. We successful blacks, we are chasing white folks out of town. We are following them. And most of the urban churches are populated by suburbia blacks who have come back there on a Sunday morning and fill up the parking lots and have guards outside to protect their hubcaps on their cars. And they have very little relationship to the people in that neighborhood. The church in the New Testament and the Jewish synagogue as a model was every three quarters of a mile there was a worship center. And it was a center that was available to the people in the neighborhood and in the village of our society. So we know that. We know that the foundation is broke. We know that. I could go on and I could just read a bunch about it. Somebody said the other day to me, they were talking about, we've lost 3,000 men in uh, Iraq. I say, we losers in the urban community of America. We lose about 3,000 people every four months in our community. Thousand. And what has happened to us? What has happened to us in our society? We are seeing so much death. We are so indifferent. It, it don't really affect us that much in society. And that we have so much of this selfish religion in us that we can't get the passion that is strong enough to do anything about the problem. Because it's passion that creates action to solve problems in community. And that we have turned the church into our own self-nurture in society. So how do we bring the passion? David had passion. So we know the foundation is broke. But he says, what can the righteous do? Who are the righteous? 
Well, the righteous in the Bible is the prodigal son. That's the quickest way I can tell you. Right. The righteous is a person who discovers in the pig pen that they don't have any righteousness of their own. And they come to Jesus Christ. And they ask Jesus Christ to forgive them for their sin, come into their life. And the Bible says that then we are clothed with the righteousness of God. Paul says, so put on the righteousness of God. And when the son returned, the father put on him the righteous robe. But he also gave to him the accounting reign. It made him responsible for the village. He's the person now have got to take responsibility for the village. So who is the righteous? The righteous is those people who have been washed in the blood of Jesus, who have been clothed in his righteousness, have had their sins forgiven, and now we take responsibility for the village. You know, the other son was there. He had been there. And he hadn't been that responsible. He had been more thinking about himself. And so when the other son comes back, the father gives him the role, gives him the responsibility to take care of the village and society. So who is the righteous? The righteous then is you and me. The righteousness is you and me. So my question this morning is this. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can we do? Let me submit to you then five things that we can do. Five things. You all know the problem. Five things that we can do. Number one is that we got to come back to truth. Truth. Jesus says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. With our idea of tolerance, we have eliminated truth. Uh, you're okay, I'm okay, they're okay. And the truth of that is none of us are okay. That's the truth. Truth has become situational. Truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. And tolerant is, you can have your truth. Tolerant is to remove any conviction out of us. And once we reduce everything down to nothing, now we can be tolerant. There is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. The basic of truth is knowing God. That's the basis of truth. What do we find truth? We find truth in the word of God. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So what do we find truth? What do we got to do? What is the first point I'm making? We got to go back to the word of God. And we got to read the Bible, not just for inspiration, but we have to read the Bible for application to our life and to our situation around us. Obeying God's word brings to us God's power. God's power in the Bible is released through our obedience to his word. And so we have to live by the word of God. And so what is my first point? We got to come back to the Bible and live it out as the word of God. That's number one. Number two, we got to learn how to pray again. Because prayer is the way God prepares us for the action he wants us to be involved in. Prayer is more than just asking God to bless me. Prayer is asking God to prepare me to do his will. Prayer is a preparation for obedience to the will of God. And so in prayer is this, that your will would be done, that his kingdom would come, 
on earth as it is in heaven. And so prayer is preparing us to take responsibility for what God's will is in society. We was left here to do the will of God. And it's in prayer that we know the will of God. It is in prayer that he guides us into the will of God. And so prayer, then, we got the D hijack prayer. Prayer has been hijacked by the name and claimant. They done hijacked it. And, and, and they have changed the words in our uh, patriotic songs. Instead of saying, oh, say, can you see by the dawn of the lights, we are saying, oh, say, can you see what's in it for me? It is more, God bless me. It is more, God bless me. That's why the prayer of Jabez went out of control. Went out of control. God expand my borders for me. Jabez was saying, Lord, expand my border. And my name is pain. And explain my border so I can be a pain reliever in the world. Jabez was not praying for himself. He was praying that he would be a channel of making provision for the other people in his village. So we got the de-hijack prayer. We got to pray God, your will be done. That your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. That's number two. Number three, number three, we got to clarify the gospel. We got to clarify the gospel. We got to decolonize the gospel. As we carried the gospel through the world, we colonized the people. And we came up with a unique system of sending the resources of those nations to Europe. And it was a European people who was preaching the gospel. And so we preached the gospel that accommodated slavery, exploitation, because we didn't really know the very nature of the gospel. The gospel is the love of God demonstrated. The gospel is the way God reconciled people to himself and to each other across racial, culture, and economic barriers. Paul had it right when he said that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. We have made reconciliation race only. And since we're not going to do it racially, we have to minimize reconciliation. And race is not the only thing, but we have made it the big thing. So when we're in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, born or free. But we are one in Jesus Christ. So we got to decolonize the gospel. As we go to this world, if we go to a world today uh, where Ben Laden has been, we're going to have to preach a gospel that is stronger than our own economic interests, that's stronger than our race. We got to see ourselves as the stewards of this power that Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to bring Jews and Gentiles together into one body and to make us one. And, and so I don't go for that being a, a black clergyman, a white clergyman, a, a Hispanic clergyman. You, have, you are set on disobedience. Just that thought is disobedient. Because the Great Commission was given to us to go to all people, to go to all ethnic groups. And so since we have so accommodated racism and bigotry, we can preach the gospel. Boy, I hear that every Sunday morning. I listen sometimes at the radio in my town and listen to those people preach. What they are preaching has nothing to do with drawing the races together across racial and social barrier. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached into all the world, to every ethnic group. 
we have a power here. And we must demonstrate that in the way we live. And so the gospel. Number four. That's number three. Number four. The church has got to be in the center place. Jesus came into this world to establish his body. To put his replacement. He showed us what God was like and how to live. He said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And he said, follow me. Follow me. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We want to see CCDA people anchor our creative ministries, our health care, our development, our housing. All these needs that we have, we want to see the anchor that within the church. And we want to see people who are running these ministries have a quality of life where they are being ministered to in a local congregation. And they got to understand the power of uniting these people together into a local church. And so we got to establish the church. And one of the great things we need to do today because I don't think we're going to be able to change this institution of church that easy. I think we need to engage as much as we can the institution of church in planting other models of the church within the neighborhood. And we need to begin to plant in these cities multiracial congregation in these communities so we can really model out what the church is like. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Finally, my last point is that if we're going to do anything creatively, you got to have a, a plan, uh, a philosophy. You know, I ask myself when I hear people preaching, I says, what is the point? What is the point? What is the point? What, what point are you trying to make? How can you get us from here to there? How can your preaching have anything to do with solving these problems in the community? So we don't have a philosopher. We don't have an organized plan within the church to accomplish our goal. We come to church to get our praises on. That's okay. That's okay. We come to church to be inspired, to feel good. That's okay. That's okay. How do we equip the saints for the work of the ministry? How do we prepare them to go out the church, outside of the church? When I was in Jamaica this summer uh, preaching, one of the beautiful things there is I was preaching, right over the door of the church, it says, your ministry began outside of the door. <laughs> outside of the door. You see, it, the church equips us to do the work of God out into the community. What are the principles? Well, these are the principles here. What is our principle? We had a purpose. We had a purpose. We had a purpose for community development. How do we develop community? How do you develop community? Well, we had to come up with a plan what was happening in Mendenhall and what was happening in other communities, success for those young blacks was to leave that community and never come back. They did not see education as solving the problem within the community. They saw education as going somewhere else and getting a job so they could buy a consumer thing, so they could look successful. I could see that. I said, then what do we got to do? What is the first step? First step is Get those young folks to relocate. Help them to stay in the community. Get some skills. Go off to college and bring those skills back to the community. Relocation. White folks heard about it. Well, they said, we want to help you. Okay, you can help us. If you really want to help us, move your family down here and join with us. And let's become brothers and sisters in this village. That's what makes CCDA work. Because we bring people back into the community. So 
relocation. Relocation is incarnation. Relocation is living out the word of God. Uh, we, the relocation cuts down on patronizing. The problem becomes our problem in the community. Number two is reconciliation. I've already talked about that. I reject centrics. I have seen the end of centrics. I saw European centric in Adolf Hitler. I saw African centric in Idi Amin. I'm seeing Arab centric in Bin Laden. That's nothing but building another racial power base. Reconciliation is bringing people together in one body. One body. I didn't say that originally. Jesus prayed that, that we might be one, that the world would know we were a Christian because of the love we have one for another. Finally, finally, our strategy is what we call redistribution. Now, I know I could have said uh, reparation. If I would have said that, all everybody would have, most of you would have got up and walked out. Because we done decided we're not going to do that. Uh, I mean, you're not going to do that. We have demonized that word. And if we practice redistribution, you know what would happen? If we took all the money today and give it to the poor, the rich would have it back tomorrow night. Because the poor would go out and buy used Mercedes. So that would be the quickest transfer of wealth in the history of the world. It would be over in a few days. So what, we need to, what do we need to redistribute? We need to distribute the means of managing and developing and subduing the resources within our community. That's going to take motivation, incentives, education. And probably one of the best things we can do is what the academy is doing. It's taking these young people here in the village and making certain that these young people, first of all, come to know Jesus Christ and then equip them to go on to the universities and get some skills and bring these skills back to the community. I'm closing with this and then I'm going to have my people to come up. Would you brothers be on your way up here? We're going to make an application this morning of what I'm talking about. The idea is that how do we take the word of God and apply it to some concrete situation within our community. And this morning I have two brothers here who have been committed to trying to do something about prison incarceration. Trying to come up with some preventive message ways of doing that. And so I'm going to give these brothers uh, five minutes to tell us about their program. Uh, thank you and good morning. My name is Pastor Matthew J. Watts. I'm the senior pastor teacher of the Grace Bible Church in Charleston, West Virginia, and also the founder of the Hope Community Development Corporation, which I modeled after the Londale Community Corporation after visiting Brother Wayne Gordon some 15 years ago. 28 years ago, I gave my life to Christ. Shortly after that, a friend of mine gave me two books, one entitled Quiet Revolution, the other one Let Justice Roll Down. And those two books helped to shape my entire ministry and worldview as a Christian. I consider myself to be a disciple of John Perkins, having read all of his books over the years. The Lord used Dr. Perkins to shape my vision of ministry that's to be the continuation of the life of Christ uh, in a village and in a community. And God used Dr. Perkins to help me catch a vision for the two greatest mission fields in this country. And the two greatest mission fields in this country is the public schools of America, and it's the juvenile justice detention incarceration system. The most neglected youth in our community are youth who are locked up in correctional facilities. Over 150,000 youth are incarcerated as, as we sit here today. And many of them will progress from the juvenile system into the adult criminal justice system. The pipeline, the farm team for our adult correctional system is the juvenile justice system. And many Christians are oblivious to this because the juvenile justice system is a closed system. 
By that I mean it's confidential, so few people know anything about what takes place. The judge is a judge and jury of one. His or her decision is final. And normally there's only a judge, prosecutor attorney, defense attorney, the children, maybe a parent, and a mental health professional in the courtroom when these decisions are being meted out. And the church must respond to this crisis that's in our society. The foundation being, being destroyed, as Dr. Perkins has so wonderfully articulated, is manifest itself in children being vulnerable, abused, and neglected. And therefore, they continue the destructive, dysfunctional patterns of the, of the parents. And we see the cycle that continues now, community spiral out of control. Uh, my brother, Dr. Harold Davis of Champaign, Illinois, uh, he now shared this vision. And he's developed a tool. It's called the Talks Mentoring Movement Incorporated. And he's developed tools to equip Christians to go back into the public school system as mentors, to build relationships with these children, and then have the natural nexus of then to build relationships with their parents. And as Dr. Perkins has challenged us this morning, we are incarnating the gospel through our own person. We build these relationships, and then the gospel is shared across these caring relationships with these children and with their parents. In our organization, we go into the correctional facilities in West Virginia every two weeks, and we meet with the children that are incarcerated, and we mentor them there. We develop an aftercare plan, and then we make a commitment to work with them and their families for at least one year after they're released to help them re-enter their community, reconnect with education, job training, and employment, and to reestablish their lives. And we thank you. And we're here today at the invitation of Dr. Perkins to share this with you. We will be with him downstairs at his book table, and we are willing to work with anyone that's here to establish a similar model in your city or your community, because I assure you that the need is great. Dr. Davis is going to come and just briefly share the vision and how simple the model is that he's developed to really engage Christians in mentoring youth both in the public school system and in our juvenile correctional and detention facilities and youth on probation. Praise the Lord. I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Perkins for the invitation in this time, and I'll be very brief. Uh, the public school is a breeding ground for secular thought. Uh, as Christians, we've given it over, and I think we need to take it back. In my city, I coordinate 100 adults in the public school kicking wisdom with over 300 children. If I knew you and if I was in your city, I would encourage you to go into a public school and mentor three children. And uh, we have a plan structure. We have a curriculum. It's all thought out. The Lord gave it to us. And uh, you would, they would become your prayer focus. And if they ended up going to your Sunday school and your vacation Bible school, that's your business. And so we have a lot of kids and a lot of Christians interacting with kids. Uh, it's racial reconciliation. One adult, three kids. We mix them up racially and class-wise. Uh, we're having a great impact, and we would love to speak to you about it in a little more detail, and we'll be downstairs at Pastor Perkins' table. If I could leave you with one thought, and that is this, what would it profit a nation to dethrone Saddam Hussein, to capture Osama bin Laden, to defeat terrorism, to eliminate Iran and North Korea as nuclear threats. What would the proper nation accomplish all of that and turn around and lose its children to crime, to violence, to destruction, to immorality? And what will a nation give in exchange for its children, which is the soul of that nation? So we invite you to join us and unite with us as we embark on this marvelous odyssey to win our children and their families to Christ. Thank you for this time. Okay. Before, before, we, have our last, before we have our last song, they're going to be at our book table uh, on the down floor at the Foundation Books table. They want to talk with people and who want to know more about this program. This is one of the solutions to the problem. This is something that we can do. The other thing I want to say, right outside of the right outside of the door there, we have this book. This is important that we get this book into the next generation hand so they can do again what 
most of the people who are here read 15 and 20 years ago. We got to get it in the hands of the center city uh, students. We got to get it in the hands of students all across the country. What I would invite you to do is to pick up one of these, and of course if you see me around, it's going to be terrible, I'm thinking to say this, that I will be willing to sign them. And so outside of the door, when you leave, you can pick up one of the copies of uh, Let Justice Roll Down.